Hello, lovely humans. I'm Wild Lee, and you are listening to Sex Stories, a podcast created in the name of openness and relational honesty to help us all lead better laid lives. As always, please keep your sexy thoughts about me and our guests to yourself, no matter how wonderfully perverted they are. Go listen to the outro to join me on my mission to spread giant ripples of love across the world if you want to, and enjoy. Our guest today is a 26-year-old Korean-American cis female. She is bisexual, collared in a 24-7 DDLG sub-dynamic that is a daddy-dom little girl submissive dynamic of three-ish years, and she's into blowjobs, sensation play, edging, and TPE, which is total power exchange. A stay-at-home mom from the South, welcome Moonlight. Hi. Hello. Can you start off by telling our listeners if you had to rate yourself on a sexual shame meter with 10 being so full of shame and one being not shamey at all today, where do you fall right now? Probably about a three or a four. Okay. Why? I'm pretty open. I'm willing to talk about any subject, nothing's off the table, but I also get embarrassed sometimes. Like I'm not afraid to talk, but I am afraid to talk. When do you get embarrassed? Because I've been noticing this in myself too, like on dates especially, but what is it like for you? Usually when I'm Actually, talking to my partner, I'm more embarrassed about opening up versus talking to a random stranger. Yeah, I totally get that. Okay, can you give us just a little overview of what your sex life is like right now and what are your favorite parts? Yeah, right now it's a little more difficult. I'm trying to get back into the swing just being postpartum. So it's mostly just finding time. But when we do find time, we always make sure it's pretty saucy. Like as much as we can get into it, we try to get into it. Amazing. Okay. And then can you just tell us what is your personal definition of sexy and what does sexy mean to you? I guess sexy to me is how you see yourself. Like I don't feel sexy unless I have eyeliner on and I'm in lingerie. So just like pajamas, I don't feel sexy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I look at my partner and he'll come home from work just drenched in sweat and work clothes. And I think he's the sexiest human being on the planet. Oh, I love that. So I, I just think that's perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I love that you gave us the example of the kind of like internal, like, do I feel sexy inside of myself versus the, oh, he is sexy kind of vibe too. Because what about when you're naked? Is that usually leaning towards sexy or away from sexy? Like, is it like lingerie or like, because that's not pajamas or lingerie? Yeah. So now I'm more comfortable than I used to be, but it took me a long time to get there. Okay. I used to not feel comfortable naked at all. Now I'm just like, eh, okay, yeah, I'm naked. It's fine. I'm, I'm cool. Okay. And does it make you feel sexy? Because sometimes I'm naked and I'm like, I'm just naked. It's fine. And then sometimes I'm naked and I'm like, I'm naked. You know? I guess it would just depend on the mood. Yeah. Okay. Like if okay. the mood is Same. right, then absolutely. But if I'm just like, eh, maybe. Great. I'm just checking in because I recently, well, I go through phases where I hear from people who like don't know that there's not a difference between like being naked and being sexually available. So I think it's like nice to just talk about explicitly sometimes. Okay. Can you tell us now? Growing up, did you ever learn explicitly about consent? Yes and no. The first time I actually experienced anything like crazy sexual, I accidentally walked in on my mom. So that's what opened up the door for consent and sexual discussion. Okay. That's a yeah, big one. That was a terrifying moment. That was like eight and oh. I wasn't expecting it. I just had to go through her bedroom to get to the bathroom and it just happened. Yeah. But we've always been super open and honest. So she was there for the conversation and, you know, we talked about everything. If you, if you have any questions. Okay. So and that was a big thing was consent is important. Wow. Okay. And then as an adult human, do you have any examples of moments where explicit consent was very hot? I don't think I do, actually. And I think that's just because my dynamic, I don't have any no's necessarily. Like I have safe words, but as far as like what's off limits, there aren't really any. So I don't really necessarily always have to give consent. Did you get into the dynamic with consent? Yes. When we started, it was consent. Okay. So it sounds like that's a platform. And is it a situation where like you would talk to a partner if for some reason something ever did come up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like at first I used to be absolutely terrified of low jobs. Now I'm like, hey, can I give you one? Can I give you one? Amazing. And so that was a big thing. Either he or I would always ask, you know, can I or do you want to or are you comfortable with this? Is this too much? Can I grab your hair or can I go further? You know, there was a lot of consent at first. And <laughs> there was an instance recently where we were discussing deep throating and we talked it out. We had a plan. We got in the shower. We got going and we both panicked at the end. Where was he coming? We hadn't discussed where he was going to come. So he let go. It just kind of got everywhere. And we're like, wait, 
I didn't ask you that. We didn't discuss it. I guess that's a good example of like, where was the consent? <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> we were trying to figure it out. And what I also hear is that you have a partner that it sounds like will learn more. It sounds like you trust a lot. And so it sounds like there is room to kind of figure it out as you go, if necessary. Did I get that right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, cool. Okay, so you told us a little bit about what happens to your shame meter when it's time to talk to a partner about sex. What happens when it's time to talk about safer sex? Has that something that historically has been like easy for you or hard? Or what would that ideal conversation be like for you? I guess ideally it would all lead to consent and comfortability. Like where are you comfortable at with who you're talking to, whether it be a partner, a family member, a friend. It's all in how comfortable you are with that person. And the consent of how much you two want to discuss it. You know, I can talk to my mom, most of my friends and my partner pretty openly. But then, you know, someone may say, I don't want these details or I'm not comfortable receiving or giving that information. Oh, so yeah. I guess it's just all of like, where's the comfortable line? At? Great. Okay. And then are you monogamous with your partner or are you guys open? We're monogamous. You're monogamous. Okay. So you don't have to have like new conversations with new people at this point. Okay. Great. Take us back. We've heard a little bit about your formative years. Fill in those gaps for us. When do you first remember hearing about sex at all? And what do you remember feeling? I guess as early as like first grade, I think, when they did the sex ed classes in elementary school, they took the girls in one room and the boys in the other room. And it was usually simply like hygienic videos, like two or three minute long videos of this is your body at this age and this is how you're developing and this is what you... So we did learn the opposite. But we learned about ourselves. But I think as far as, as early as that goes, that would be the earliest. Okay. And being a giggly little kid, I would just laugh it off. Like, oh, haha, this is so silly. I never super took it seriously until I was older. Okay. And then like contextually, when you were getting those lessons, was that before or after you walked in on your mom? Like were those connected at all? Or were like the school lessons kind of in another realm for you? The school lesson started around first grade. I walked in on my mom around third grade. So kind of in between all of that. So when you walked in on your mom, did you know what was happening? Like, did you know what it was or was it only after she talked to you? And was that her first like conversation with you? Oh, I definitely knew what was happening. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> okay. it was pretty obvious. That was our first awkward and open conversation. Because before that, there was, you know, there's the puberty talk and this is what you can expect with your body changes. I got that book I think most teenage girls or preteen girls get of what to expect with your body yeah, yeah. and with the awful like chalk drawings on it. <laughs> that was the first time we really openly discussed what happened and, you know, the gist of it. And so it sounds like you grew up in like an open-ish household. What was the vibe like where you grew up? Did you grow up in the South? I did, yes. Okay. What was that like? <laughs> Coming from pretty conservative parents, my mom was pretty open, but she's also a nurse. Okay. So yep. she would do a lot of things openly. I never, I mean, kids talking to their parents, it was kind of awkward. Like, oh, I'm asking my mom or we're discussing the most uncomfortable topic a preteen wants to talk about. But then again, if I had questions, for example, like period stuff or pubescent stuff, I was comfortable talking to her about it because we had an open mind. Okay. And then what about like friends or siblings or anyone else in your sphere? Like when did you start to really understand the juicy parts of sex, like the emotional turn ons and stuff? Like when did that start to come alive for you and how? Sixth grade. <laughs> uh, very blatantly sixth grade. I am a very rotten child and I would always sneak off to go to the bathroom. And in sixth grade, I did not quite understand it. I just knew it was enjoyable, but I would go to the bathroom and masturbate. And I would just tell my teacher, oh, I had an upset stomach. So I'd be in there for at least a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that you were doing this at school. Yeah, yeah. It was just my excuse to get out of class like once or twice a week. Oh, like, fun. oh, I'm sorry. My stomach hurt. Wow. Okay. So legit, were you like standing? Were you like in a stall? Or were you just like sitting yeah, on the toilet? Yeah, I would sit on the toilet and just kind of straddle it. And wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. But I knew I had the urges and I just, I needed to get it out. Yeah. Do you remember where those came from? Like, was it just an internal thing or did you see ideas to do that anywhere? Because I definitely got the idea to touch myself from books. <laughs> at first it was internal. I don't think I started like searching or looking at pornography. I think it's like eighth grade Okay, is when I started looking at that. So yeah, it was definitely just an internal of this feels nice. I want to do it more. Okay, cool. And then when did you start getting curious about partners? And or did your masturbations like 
go beyond the school bathroom and get into the rest of your life? Or like, was there any evolution there? Almost every night at home. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. It started in the school bathrooms and it escalated <laughs> at home, bedtime, that type of stuff. But as far as like getting into it with partners, my first partner sexual experience was eighth grade. That is when I lost my virginity. Okay. What do you remember about it and how was it for you? Ooh, it was not a pleasant experience. I made, again, I was a terrible, terrible child. I was on medication that was not my own. So it was drug induced and we were teenagers. We were horny. We were not really caring about what happened. So things went in places and, you know, it got nasty and messy, but we did end up having sex. I don't remember too much because of the drugs, but I just remember not enjoying it. It was consensual at eighth grade. It was consensual. It just was not what I wanted it to be. It was not fun. Right, right. So how did that kind of affect you going forward or the next day? Like, was there any self-judgment or was it just like, I want to do something different now? Oh, I hated myself for a while, but then it became more of a, I want to find someone to experience the fun with. Hmm. I don't want to experience the bad again. And that actually opened the door for me wanting to try things with girls. Let me go back. My first partner was a guy. Okay. So that opened the, well, can this be better with a girl? I want to find out, you know, maybe a guy and a girl. My first threesome was ninth grade, so it really didn't take me that long to figure that out. Oh my gosh! Wow, a ninth grade threesome. How was that? Was that your next sexual experience? It was, yes. Okay, that's how was it? It was two girls. I was at one of my friends' house, and she had another friend come over, and it was a sleepover. And we all just kind of started jokingly kissing, and then it turned into making out, and then it turned into some very like intense touches and fingerings, and then we all stripped, and it just got insane from there. Now that I think about it, I kind of wish I'd chosen partners I would have been better with intimately because, you know, being a teenager, being a kid, you don't really think about intimacy. You just, oh, we're doing it because it's fun and it feels good. I do kind of wish there would have been a more intimate connection. So I think that would be the main lesson learned there. Mm. Do you feel like it's possible if you could like articulate for your ninth grade self, like what would more intimate look like? Like more talking, more touching, slower? Like what is that kind of like sexy intimacy for you? Being in a relationship with a person. Being able to communicate better with a person. So was it a big deal for you to be by, or was that just like fine in your household? Because you did say it was kind of a conservative area. How was that for you? I came out to my mom between eighth and ninth grade, and she thought I was a lesbian because I never brought guys home. So she was <laughs> like, okay, yeah, that's fine. But I come from a, as conservative as my mom is. My parents are divorced, so I'll, okay. I'll talk separately sometimes about each. As conservative as my mom's side of the family is, her dad is gay. Okay. So she's, you know, open and accepting. And she thought I was a lesbian. So, of course, she's just, oh, okay, you know, I could still possibly get grandkids one day. You know, it's fine. So, yeah, she was she was pretty cool. My dad was a little harder to get behind me. And he's still every once in a while. He's like, yeah, no, it's just a phase or whatever. But I've dated women long term in my past. He's accepted, but it's more of a, okay, not a big deal. Okay. What about at school? Was it still fun? Because, like, when I was growing up, I'm a little bit older than you, but, like, it was still sort of like, ooh, are you gay? Like, depending on where, because we were in the middle of nowhere on the countryside. So what was it like? I then? was very, very open about it. I just, I didn't care what anyone thought because it was a big part of who I was at the time. I was just like, yeah, this is who I am. I actually had girls. There was one girl in eighth grade. She came up to me and approached me and she told me that she was in the closet still. And of course I didn't out her, but I was her first female experience. <gasps> wow. Okay. Did you have this sense that you were like started on things young? Your timeline is younger than mine was, which I was, I'm just jealous a little bit. But also, like, how was that for you? Were, it sounds like you were just like, oh, another horny kid, not like me, but you had, you, you <laughs> made it work. <laughs> you made it happen. I make it sound easy. It was really, really rocky. At such a young age, I did sleep with several people. I've got a pretty high count, which I'm not super proud of, but I did learn a lot through all of that. Hmm. So it's mixed. I'm, okay with it. I'm not always proud of it. I sound like I am, which it needs to my past. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I do wish that I had waited longer on everything. So that's where I kind of get messed with myself a little bit in okay. the head. I'm just like, eh, I wish I waited. But then again, I learned a lot from it. Okay. I mean, I'm a big fan of growth experiences and also learning experiences. Is there anything you want to say specifically to it? Also, like, I always want to just like support people wildly in like, I understand the weird self-judgment feelings that we just have to work through them on our own. But I used to in my young 20s be like really concerned about numbers. And for me, it was only when I was like maybe 27 or eight that I was like, I don't care anymore. I've definitely grown past it. It's just 
my past is my past. Everyone yeah. has one. It's not the worst thing in the world. Okay. So what else from your formative experiences do we need to know? You asked earlier about like how early I got into kink or when I realized I was kinky. That was also eighth grade. That oh, was wow. a lot of finding of porn online. And at the time I lived with my dad instead of my mom. And so my stepmom caught me one night on my dad's computer looking at porn. And she told me, she said, if you're going to do this, do it in your bedroom. So she got me a laptop and okay. she told me if I had any questions and any realm of the whole topic that I could come to her and ask. So we had a even more open than my mom did. We had a very, very open line of communication. Nice. And she actually saved me from a lot of different things. You know, we got on birth control. We had an STD scare in 10th grade. Yeah, I was comfortable enough because we had the open line. I was, I need a doctor's appointment. I need your help in this situation. She was the first person I told when I got pregnant right out of high school because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So my family as a whole is very open. My stepmom more than my mom, but two very confident women I can go to for help. Amazing. I want that for everyone. Okay. So you discovered through porn that you were kinky and then like, how did yes. it translate? <laughs> my Google searches, which are super embarrassing now, but it was a lot of like, master slave dynamic stuff or like the more intense stuff that maybe even as a teenager you shouldn't be looking at <laughs> like intense impact play or like very heavy slave domination type stuff and dominatrix type stuff <laughs> not stuff most teenagers like to look up how is it for you because i've watched more sex in real life than i actually have porn but like i find it so alarming to watch another person receive impact play even though i like some pretty intense stuff myself and you didn't have kinky experiences until you watched porn, right? I got that right? Right. Okay. How was it for you? Like, did you know what it was? Were you just like, I want to try it? Like, yeah, it was kind of that instant. Like, at first I was like, oh, this is interesting. But then I was like, well, it looks like fun. And I'm a very, I don't know what the right term is, but I love hearing the sounds of hearing the Auditory. girls or even the guys. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So hearing that just kind of turned me on even more, okay. which made me want to try it even more. I'm like, oh, you can get these sounds from this person. I wonder if I can make the same sounds and enjoy it just as much. Oh, I love that enjoyment was part of it. How did you know to search Master Slave? Like, I literally did not even learn about that until I was like at coffee with someone that was like, so a master and looking for a slave. And I was like, I'm interested, but what? <laughs> it started just with Pornhub looking through like their different genres. And then from there, you know, you click BDSM and then they'll give you like subtopics. And so it just kind of took off from there. And then I would Google separate stuff and find quote unquote worse things under each topic to look at. So when did this start like working its way into your sex life or what was kind of the rest of high school and formative years? Most of high school, I just kind of slept around and did the vanilla thing, just partner to partner, or some threesomes every once in a while. My first dynamic or BDSM relationship, I was just graduated from high school. And I met my first partner through FetLife, which that website does kind of get a bad rap. It's not the worst if you're careful. I was not careful at 18. Okay. I did not know better at 18. I know better now. I never tell anybody to avoid that website, but I'm not necessarily promoting it either. Do you want to tell us any things that you've learned that are like pro tips or like things I wish I'd known when I was starting out? I find it incredibly overwhelming on there. Pro tip, if anyone, and I mean anyone, man, woman, transgender, anybody messages you randomly and says they want to meet up or that you know they claim to be a dom or a master or a dominatrix you know any of those titles if they come at you with well i'm in charge of you now or you have to listen to me just block them that is not going to be any kind of positive reaction yeah that's only good advice i learned a hard lesson that way okay so it sounds like it was tough starting out oh yeah like i said i met my first dom on that website and we were in a very short maybe six month relationship and it started out nice i ended up moving in with him and then it just ended very terribly um it got physically violent um oh, i did get pregnant and it turned very threatening so i had to leave pretty much every like i packed like two boxes and that's all i could fit in my car type of i left thank goodness you're safe i am so glad to hear that you are safe good for you good escape good job yeah it did teach me a lot though when it was good i learned a lot of the different kinks that i like that was my first time doing any kind of impact play that was my first time with toys vibrators and different things like that because i didn't really have one growing up yeah ironically enough with having open moms that's one thing i didn't have yeah same but it was a poly relationship as well so it taught me if i liked the polyamorous dynamic and if i could get along having multiple partners because it was my one male partner and we had two female partners and i'm still friends with one of them as well. uh, so 
In terms of the stuff that you learned about yourself that you liked, tell us more about the impact play. Like what kind of impact do you enjoy? I enjoy dull or not dull thing. Yeah, maybe that's the right term. The like opposite study? is sharp. So I, yeah, study. Thank you. That's the term. Yeah. I like paddle and bloggers and things of that nature. Cat of nine tails sometimes mm. and a couple more sharp pains, but I like study way more. I just don't like thingy a lot. Yeah, thingy yeah. is not enjoyable. <laughs> I like like a dash of stingy here and there, but like give me more study and like let me feel very powerful and then stingy me and then let's go do something nice. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That sounds perfect. That sounds right. Wow. Okay. So you got out of that one. What was your sex life like after that? Like, do you want to speak about sex while pregnant at all? Is that relevant for you? Or like, what, what do you want to no, Yeah, about? absolutely. It actually, as far as partnership goes, I was single throughout my whole pregnancy and until my little one turned two-ish roughly. So that was just a lot of hands-on a lot. I mean, I was very, very sexually charged while pregnant. So that was wow. a lot of masturbating. I did have my own toys, so I was able to enjoy that a lot more solo. Okay. <laughs> it was hard for me to get back into the sex life of things and it, not even dating, but just finding a partner I was comfortable with after having a kid. But I think that was just me getting back into the scene. Okay. Was it hard to masturbate when you had a belly? Like, could you reach yourself? I don't think I've asked anyone this question. I just didn't even ask my best friend when she was pregnant. I'm so curious all of a sudden. It was easier for me. I didn't have a huge belly. I'm a tiny person. I'm 4'10". So my belly Whoa. didn't get super big. Yeah, I'm very small. <laughs> I'm a short girl. Yeah, so my belly didn't get super big. So I didn't have any problems. But I did have some very nice wands and vibrators. So if I didn't feel like using my hands necessarily, or if I needed the extra reach, it wasn't difficult. Also, a detachable shower head is very enjoyable in the right setting. <laughs> Amazing. Ama- uh, I agree. How tall is your partner? I don't remember exactly how tall he is. He's five foot something. He's an average height male. Okay. So stand up sex can be a little challenging. But other than that, we don't really have any difficulties. Okay. Wow. I'm five foot eight, so I rarely feel tiny. Are there any ways that your petite stature have like made you feel a certain way sexually? Like, is it part of your little dynamic at all? I think it is. Yeah. I think especially because I like wearing the cute little outfits. <sighs> Tell us more. Why don't you just introduce your whole little? Okay. So there's outfits. Tell us what kind of outfits there are. you like. I don't have that many now, mostly just because when you have children, they're the priority. Sure. I do have a onesie, and I think it's like Little for Big or something is the website. They have all kinds of cute things on there. So I have a onesie. I have a couple of like tutu skirt type things that I like to wear. Cute. Yeah. I don't get to dress up super often, but when I do, I like to go full on out. When I did have a full wardrobe, I did at one point in time with the partner I had before my current partner. I would wear the gothic thick heels with my outfits and really like the knee-high socks with the frills around them and pigtails and like the whole shebang. As little as I could get, I would carry around the stuffy everywhere I went. And now we did make sure being in public that it was appropriate outfit. So I never wore anything that said like, I love daddy on it in public or anything like super just crazy. Okay. But I definitely did look more child-esque. Not inappropriately, but you know, in that sense of like, I would have pigtails as a 24 year old or yeah, yeah. you know it's being in that type of clothing i get it i'm 33 and i still like urban outfitters is my favorite sort like i go shop their sale rack and now i've like gotten so much older than the people that work there and i'm like i know <laughs> it's fine <laughs> It's cool. This it's is different. my style. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I just like tiny tank tops. Okay, so when did that version of your little self develop? Like it sounds like it was after that first one, but like how's your understanding of your submissive self kind of evolved? Yeah, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. My first dynamic was a DS, a dominant submissive dynamic. I actually learned later that he realized I had a little side of me, but he wanted to nourish the submissive side because I was new to kink at the time. Okay. Which I actually kind of appreciate. But my second partner, it was a man and two other women. So again, another poly dynamic. And he helped me blossom into my little side. He was the one that helped me get all my outfits and encouraged me wearing them. And I did call him daddy, but I also would call him sir if we were in a scene. So there was that very split line of we're in a sexual scene. You will call me sir. You know, we're just at home daddy is appropriate type of deal or if we're out and about i have no shame so i would even call i'm my current partner i'll yell across a store daddy but yeah there was a definite line in that second relationship okay what's the current one like and how is it for you having these different textures of dom sub relationships so my current one it is 24 7 
I have submissive roles that I do. And a lot of people, it sounds super nonchalant or vanilla. Or some of our mutual friends are still to be like, oh, I'm a little jealous. I wish I could get my partner to do this. But I wake up in the morning. I get his work clothes, coffee, car started. You know, I do all of his prep for work. That is a submissive role that I take. And it helps that I'm a stay-at-home person as best as I can. I keep house. I make all of the meals. And I maintain the home. That's more of the submissive roles that I do. It's more lenient. I don't have super strict roles. I don't have to call him sir or anything like that, unless specifically asked. But I'm also a little as in I can, hey, daddy, can we snuggle? Or, you know, I want to, you know, do this activity with you that's completely not sexually related. You know, let's go get ice cream or, you know, just cuddle or let's draw a picture. Let's paint together. You know, something silly. But even in a sexual aspect, daddy is just a comfortable term for me. Yes. And it is for him as well. So even, you know, sexually pillow talk or you know asking permission to come i'll still say daddy that's oh that is our go-to that is what i call him unless very specifically otherwise requested which really i think that's happened once or twice is this your first 24 7 dynamic my second my your second. second one okay what is the process for that like like what have the conversations around it been like and like how is it for you going into it my current partner when we got together we were just kind of sleeping together mm-hmm. um, but we very openly discussed kink it was like one of the first conversations i was like so hey i'm this kinky person blah 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 this is what i'm into kind of just developed from there nothing super excited i did and i was like hey are you comfortable with me calling you daddy is that okay and you know it just kind of took off and we've okay. gone from you know more lenient to more strict and we just kind of flow with the dynamic wherever it needs to be at the time so we've gone through phases where it's been more strict but especially right now with us having such little people in the house, it's a lot more lenient. That's amazing. So you're able to like maintain the 24-7 dynamic, but it sounds like it's a flexible container. Does having that 24-7 thing, f- I'm totally projecting here, so please replace it with your experience in every way possible. For me, I imagine that there would be this like simmering turn on, even if it's not explicitly sexual, not like we're about to fuck, but just that energy that kind of like makes me feel connected to my person. Like I used to feel that across the distance with my former dom. Does that exist for you or is it just kind of like baked into relationship? We've kind of gone through waves of that. Like right now, it's definitely just kind of mixed into the relationship, but we've gone through spells, I guess you would call them, like just little time periods. Where it's definitely been more heated than others. We went through a time period where we lived in separate states from each other. And it was definitely more heated during that time in certain aspects because there was a lot, a lot of dirty talking and texting. It definitely helps keep you connected, but it also keeps things more interesting, a little bit spicier too. I think it's a little bit, in my opinion, it's a little bit of a higher expectation, especially in text messaging. You can really build it up. Whereas when you're in person with each other 24-7, it's not dull, but it can get, a little more difficult you're not always dirty texting anymore or dirty talking anymore but there's definitely i go up to my daddy constantly and i'm like hey you're hot or hey you're good looking you got a good looking face or i i really like his butt i'm always grabbing (sighs) and smacking and just touching his butt (laughs) oh amazing he'll come up to me and just smack my ass or grab me and pull me into a random kiss or a hug or you know come up and just grab my chest you know appropriate for us what others might not consider super appropriate but Random things like that. We'll just get into it randomly with each other. I love that. If I'm in a space where there is permission or it's private enough that I can just be desired, like grabbed and desired by my partner, you know, assuming that we're not in a fight or whatever. Yes, please. Can you tell us a little bit about the sensations that you like to enjoy, especially if they're in the context of your submissive self? So I really like, ironically enough, for not liking stingy pain. I love the, I think it's called the Wartenberg pinwheel. Yes. I think that's what it is. Yeah. I love feeling that. I love the sensation or the warmth from wax play. I'm very big more recently into sensual soft touches, which is super mm-hmm. crazy because I went from starting off being really big and growing into heavy play and heavy scenes. And I want to build this pain tolerance. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And actually, more recently, I was actually talking to my partner about this. I've backtracked and I want to slow down like a lot sensual touches, kissing. Not necessarily just diving right into heavy sexual experiences. It's, I want to take things slow. And I don't necessarily know why. Now, some of that too, I don't quite understand. I'm a little confused about it, hmm. but I'm okay with it. I'm interested to see where I grow from. It. Yeah. It's such a cool moment of possibility. And what I love is hearing that you're open to the shift because then who knows what could happen and who knows what sort of like interesting combinations might 
reveal themselves. Mm-hmm. Wow. Have you ever had a big shift like that before? Or was it just like pretty kinky stuff? I have not. I relate it to me being postpartum with my second child. Mm. That was a crazy time period of before being super crazy sexually charged. Of, I want to do this. I want to get into this. I want to do that. And now I'm just like, well, maybe let's just take a step back and try to figure things out again. I've actually had to refigure my own self out what gets me off by myself because I went through a little bit of a like a month or two of not being able to get off at all and I just felt super disappointed I always made sure my partner got off but I was just there and ashamed of it and I I talked to him about it after a while at first I didn't want to open up but now I'm like well now I'm able to get off on my own again yeah cool that's a small victory you know we can grow from that I'm having to relearn myself essentially oh my gosh yeah that's a big deal so what sorts of things are you exploring with that in mind? Is edging a part of that for you? I'm not able to edge myself because I just get frustrated and I just finish. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't. Ed- I'm really lazy at edging myself. Like, I'll do it if someone orders me to, like, every so often. But do you get edge? Does that work for you or does it, is it my... Uh, if my okay. partner is doing it, yes. Yes, okay. I enjoy it very much. I recently, it took me forever, but I had to recently rediscover, like, porn and what gets me off that way because I was just trying to stay in my head and just enjoy it Uh but I really needed something visually and audibly to get me over the edge so I've had to rediscover that but I mean yeah that was really still is really enjoyable amazing tell us a little bit about blowjobs you said that you love them yeah so I was traumatized by them once upon a time oh my first partner after high school my first DS dynamic I didn't even want to touch his penis I didn't want to look at it I didn't want to see it Sex was fine because I couldn't see it or anything. But as far as it going in my mouth, the thought was just so traumatizing. And there were a couple of forced attempts, which Uh, just turned me off to it even more. Yeah. So my partner that I'm currently with, we had a very big discussion of, you know, at first he couldn't touch me at all. If he did, I would freeze and panic. It was just me being in my head and doing my thing. And then we grew from, okay, you know, you can touch me or you can touch my head or you can grab my hair. And now it's just, Hey, can I give you a nice sloppy blowjob with some deep throating involved? Or yeah, you know, we're actually working towards that. I'm kind of a terrible deep throater, but we're getting there. <laughs> Ter- okay, let's unpack this word terrible. What does it mean to you? It means that you're not yet achieving your desired outcome? Mostly, yes. I have in the shower because I know what would happen. I've got a really strong gag reflex, so mm. I've thrown up during a blowjob. I've worked past it. One time that I really threw up, I was embarrassed, but I was like, no, fuck it. I'm doing this, and it's happening, so I just... Spit it out, rinse my mouth real quick, and went back to it. Okay. And I have gotten, but yeah, that was not the most taste-wise pleasant experience. I know. But I've gotten a lot better. Now if I gag, I can stop myself, take a breath, and then I can just get back to it. It's a big improvement for me. But it's definitely not the end goal. I'm not where I can just full force go yet. But not where I want to be. Okay. What is your goal for deep throating? Like, out of the shower? Like, what would make you feel like a successful deep throater? A successful deep throat for me would be, one, not in the shower, like you mentioned, and two, to be able to go until he comes down my throat. I have oh. not had that happen. That is my goal. I want that, too. I'm so curious about what that would be like. I wonder if I would just, like, cough or sneeze it up, but I'm, like, very curious to find out. But, like, it, it's also that thing where the easiest way that I've been throat fucked, also the way that I got throat herpes, because my partner, we didn't use condoms for that, and he didn't say honest truths about the people he'd been with, even though we had made agreements to talk openly about that. I absolutely got it from like laying with my head hanging off of the bed and having him just like fuck my throat that way. And it was really hot. Like I have to say, like, even though it's a really enjoyable position, it was really hot and it was, it was the easiest way. And I actually didn't know that way beforehand. So we've done that a lot, actually. That's one of my favorite blow drop positions. Oh yeah. It's super enjoyable, especially because it leaves my female body open yes. so he can touch yes. and grab whatever he yes. wants. Yes, so hot. And it's like nice to be able to like, if they're over me and then I can just like use the legs to kind of like push myself a little bit, it's great. Yes, and me loving my partner's ass, I like to wrap my arms around and grab it and just really pull him in when I'm in the yes. mood. Yes, okay, so that's a great segue. You love his ass. Okay, do you stick your tongue inside? Like, what do you what do you love about it? What do you do with it? I have. At first, I was super hesitant just because of the general area. But after some discussion and, and talk about it, every once in a while, I will eat his ass. Yeah. yeah. I have done it. It's really enjoyable, especially because he's become more vocal with me. So I really, really, really get into it when I can hear him. Ooh. That's such a turn on for me. Being able to hear his moans and his sounds and his pillow talk, that is 
so nice for me. Amazing. I can get off mentally just from hearing it. It's so adorable. Like it's cloud nine for me. Amazing. Oh, what about your own asshole? How is she? I mean, like anally, we do it every once in a while, but it's not my favorite. It's not the worst. I definitely have to be in the mood for it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Do you enjoy receiving fingerings or like rim jobs or anything? I love being fingered in either hole. Fingering is my favorite. It's my favorite way to get off. It's my favorite way to enjoy pretty much anything. So yeah, no, that's not a problem at all. Mixing it in with regular sex if I'm on top, that's really enjoyable too. It'll actually bring me to an orgasm faster. Oh, really? Like fingers with sex, yours or the partner's or both? My partner. Okay, cool. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know where the fingers go because if there's also a cock there, like how will I not pinch myself? Because I have pinched myself. And so this is where I'm like, am I bad at 3D bodies? I don't know. But then with some people, they just make it all work. No, I'm actually super awkward because when I have my hands are free, like for example, if I'm on top in a cowgirl position, I just kind of grab onto him like yeah i'll grab a handful of hair i'll scratch the back of his chest because i i try to dig my nails in him as much as possible mm. but i just i'm so uncomfortable touching myself as weird as that sounds like i just get awkward touching myself I'm like well he knows what he's doing with me mm. i'm just gonna try to figure out what to do with my hands <laughs> for him yeah i've thought about it i've definitely thought about it but i have not gotten to that point of okay. additionally messing with myself or playing with myself while we're fucking does he ever order you to? Because that was the gateway for me. I was like too shy to touch myself. I would do it, but I would just be like touching myself performatively for them until I was with my first dom. And he was like, show me. And I was like, okay. Never in person. We've done it like long distance wise. We would send each other different videos and stuff. And I would get told to do certain things. But as far as in person, no, we've actually not crossed that bridge. Yet. Okay. What else do you guys get into that we don't know about? Like, what other turn-ons have we not hit? Or what other parts of your body or his body? We've had a couple of crazy, like, just sexual experiences. Like, this started going back to blowjobs a little bit. I was, my head over the bed giving him a blowjob. And it was unexpected. But he lifted me up to where my pussy was in his mouth. And I was just, like, (sighs) in the air. Like, if you could visually, like, 69, but standing up. That's awesome. like the craziest, most insane experience ever. It was really, really awesome. He was just like fully holding you? Mm-hmm. Fun. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Was it hard to give a blowjob that way or was it just so hot you're just bamboozled? <laughs> yeah, it was just so hot. I was just bamboozled. It was insanity. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. Wow. Ooh, what creativity, too. That's so sweet. It was not played. It was super unexpected. It was just a super, like, just nice, hot, heavy, intense moment. And it's definitely one I will never forget. That's amazing. And that's the stuff that I'm like, no, we have to have like a baseline level of like communication and trust so that that sort of magic can happen. Because when I'm busy being like scared or my partner is, then that's not, that's not what, okay. Ooh, okay. What other hot things have you gotten into? Like what other things have just made you melt as a submissive or as a little? When I was officially collared, because it didn't quite happen the way either of us, I think, imagined it would happen. But I did try to make his, fancy or what he envisioned it happened as much as I possibly could while also coming to terms with a couple things myself internally but the big thing is I'm kind of terrible at swallowing I'm a spitter and a quitter which is a great thing too yes 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 there's nothing wrong with it that's just a running joke between me and him it's constantly spitters or quitters but no he means it all in fun when you said that though I just see you as like a cum sprinkler like you I don't know yeah I don't know it's super funny but that was the night I was collared I did swallow and I swallowed at least once or twice before that, but that was a huge accomplishment for me. I was so proud of myself. I was like, this is definitely my committing moment to him because that's something I can really, really struggle with and I want to get better at. I just can't get past the texture. If you don't like eating oysters, for me, it's the same type of texture. (laughs) Yeah. I came a long way with my like texture mind powers. I really hear that. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yeah. Slimy is a tough one. Can you speak to the difference between your little girl self and submissive self, like specifically? Do they feel different inside to you? I know we heard a little bit about kind of like the clothes and the vibe, but can you just tell us how you understand him? So the submissive aspect is more of my day-to-day stuff. We'll bring it into sex a little bit. Every once in a while, we'll openly discuss with each other of, hey, I'm needing a more dominant night of I need to be dominated. Mm. Or, you know, I'll ask me, like, hey, are you needing to get anything out? You know, anything you're wanting to project and do? And we've talked about that recently. I have a night where I just need more central play, following that up with, I need a night to be heavily dominated. And with that, we'll do the full-on, instead of 
little girl here in clothes, bondage and blindfolds and, you know, cuffs and collies and different things of that more adult aspect of BDSM. That's the big difference for me is the type of intimacy that we have with it. Because it's definitely intimacy in BDSM. I think a lot of people actually miss that. But when you have a partner you trust, that's a big deal because he can put a blindfold on me and basically do whatever he wants. We have that level of trust. So yeah, that's the big defining line because in everyday stuff, I call him daddy for everything. I do my normal routine. So it's mostly the sexual aspect of where it differs the most. Yeah. This might be impossible to put into words, but what's the part of you that was called to a 24-7 dynamic and total power exchange? Those are strong words. Like, can you speak to that and how it makes you kind of like feel inside? For me, it's totally gushy. I want to describe how cute your smile is because people are not going to see your face. To me, it looks shy, proud, blushy, and just like it feels like the giddy joy that I feel when I'm in that space. Did I get that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That was a perfect description. It's definitely partner oriented because I did try this before and failed, but the partner I have now, and like I said, this is super gushy, and just head over heels in love with him. I wholeheartedly believe he is my soulmate, and that definitely is a contributing factor to all of it. Mm. We have built from the ground a super deep level of trust that I don't think a lot of couples have yeah. not in like the vanilla or kinky aspect but just in general of course we are not a perfect couple we have things we have to work on individually and with each other yeah but we just have a pretty damn good open line of communication we can talk about almost everything and anything wow. and that's just a huge big deal because my love for him is so deep I want to overcome my hard limits I want to overcome my nose I want to give all of that and just not exist for him that's my wow. end goal in all of this. Is just I'm trying to put this in the words as best as I can. Yeah, it's so tricky. He reciprocates, of course, but it's just that is my big deal. I just love him so so much that that's the goal is to just be able to hand pretty much my whole self just give to him to love and care for and all of that gushy gushy stuff. The greatest gift, and it can only be given to someone who is worthy. As I've been kind of like on the hunt for new partnership or like really craving domination, I really am having conversations with people and like, no, no, I do want to be utterly and totally degraded, but I have to be very clear that you understand my value before that is satisfying to me. Oh, degradation can be fun, but it can be scary too. Yeah. Mm. Especially if it's taken out of context. Yeah. Are, are you into like, do those things get you like what in the total, like finding your limits? Like, where are we on the, like, what feels delicious to you right now? Like what sort of like names or actions? We've done degradation play and I simultaneously enjoyed it and I simultaneously cried because it upset me. Mm. It's a very hard thing to get. For me, I enjoy it, but then again, like the thoughts are in the back of my mind and I'm just like, does he actually mean this? I'm like, I no, 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 he doesn't, but I can't get it out of my head. So then I get upset, yeah. which just upsets me more. I'm like, oh man, I ruined the mood, but it's not even a big deal. That one's a little hard for me because I do enjoy it, but we don't do it as much. Yeah. But I enjoy a lot of kinks that I think can cross lines or boundaries and degradation is one of them. I actually found there are a lot of people that have issues with CDLD. A lot of people assume that it's sexualizing children and it's not. It is consent between two adults. Yes. Like I enjoy dressing younger than I am. I enjoy coloring in books and the millions of stuffed animals that I have and, you know, painting pictures and stuff. All under the realm of being a consensual adult. And even sexually I do call him daddy sexually, but again, I am a consenting adult. That's the big thing that people miss with that whole We're just doing grown-up play. (laughs) Yes, basically, yes. When you have those moments that are at your edge that do sort of give that dual shake of like, yum, but oh no. Is that something that is solved for you in aftercare or is there enough nurturing there? Like what emotionally kind of like helps you continue toward your limits or to have fun? It sounds, if I'm listening to you correctly, correctly and please correct me if i'm wrong it sounds like you're having fun finding the edges of your limits with someone you trust yeah our limits well my limits are always growing and changing and extending like we'll get to the edge of the limit and we'll either backtrack if necessary or we'll push through and see how far we can get before there's another line drawn Mm -hmm. but when it comes to something like that to where i'm really on the edge i'm kind of terrible at aftercare because I don't feel like I need it. Not that I don't want it necessarily. I just, I'm just leave me alone. Let me figure it out mentally myself or physically mm-hmm. myself and let me come to you. That's my big thing is I always go to my partner if I need it. Not that I don't want it. I just, I like to figure things out myself first. Mm-hmm. And then I'll usually, Hey, can we talk about this? Or, you know, this is how I'm feeling. Can we snuggle and that kind of stuff? I need to mentally prepare myself first. That's my big thing. 
Got it. Got it. So you're more like, let me process alone and then I'll come to you to process when I'm ready. And it sounds there's like you know that your partner that is there for I you. Just, I need you the need. mental. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We can have a full blown Zanoa fight. And we know, you know, if we need to cool down or step away, I can always go to him afterwards, even if it's not a comfortable conversation. Hey, can we talk? I know that neither of us, you know, we don't want to have the hard conversations, but we yeah. do have the hard conversations. Fuck yeah. I love full-blown vanilla fight just as a phrase <laughs> yeah what's well, that kinky fight a kinky fight would just be kinky yeah. especially yeah. we've done we've done some fancy consensual non-consent we've done some really typical quote-unquote role-playing of you know someone breaking in or surprising you or whatever the, the kind of stuff you would find on like Pornhub and different the obviously fake stuff or you know, I've been tied down and I've had to fight or he'll, you know, bear hug me and I have to get out of it. But that way fail, of course, but that's the end goal. But we have discussed, and I don't think we've acted on it, but we have discussed more recently my hair. If my hair is in a certain hairstyle, like right now it's just in a bun, but if it's either in a blatant ponytail, like a very obvious ponytail, or if it is down, that is our go signal for CNC, specifically related to blowjobs. We've done some really typical quote-unquote role-playing of you know someone breaking in or surprising you or whatever the, the kind of stuff you would find on like Pornhub and different the obviously fake stuff or you know I've been tied down and I've had to fight or he'll you know bear hug me and I have to get out of it but that way fail of course but that's the end goal um but we have discussed and I don't think we've acted on it but we have discussed more recently my hair if my hair is in a certain hairstyle like right now it's just in a bun but if it's either in a blatant ponytail like a very obvious ponytail or if it is down that is our go signal for cnc specifically related to blowjobs like if i wear my hair down one day that is an obvious open invitation unless otherwise specified that if he wants a blowjob he's allowed to just pull me aside pull down his pants and go to town Whoa. so that's stuff we've discussed like i said i don't think we've acted on that yet but that is something we've openly discussed that's the lines and limits too. And I told him there have been a couple of times where I was like, hey, my hair is down. I have a migraine. This is not the open invitation. Okay. And he's always respected that. Amazing. Yeah. But otherwise, it's my hair is down. Take your That's shot or don't take your shot. It's fine. Literally the perfect thing for a 24 7. Like, wow. I really like li just hearing that. I'm like, oh, maybe I should throw it back. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> well, I hair is just easier for us especially because my hair is almost always up so it's pretty obvious if i'm wearing my hair down that is a very open invitation but we've discussed you know me wearing a specific pair of panties or a specific bra or you know lingerie or something yes. there's been you know different things have been thrown out there well, what if you go to sleep completely naked or what if you wear this during the day so that way i know you know we've discussed several options but the hair was just the easiest thing for us in our dynamic so fun. So you guys are monogamous. Would you ever consider threesomes or more sums, or do you like to keep it between you two now that you're an item? We've discussed opening up to having a play partner or two. At some point in time, I would like to bring at least another female into the relationship, even if it's just for sexual fun. I do want to try double penetration with another male. That's just slightly harder finding a guy that he's agreeable on. Because that's our big thing is have to be agreeable. And we, we, both, we both have to agree. But I have to be agreeable with a female. He has to be agreeable with the male. It's a big thing. If it's not compatible, then obviously. It's not yeah. Compatible. I think about, I literally think about that a lot because I'm like, for my future double or triple penetration fantasy, what will those energies be like? How will they get together? You know, because like I think about like putting together people I know and I'm like, I don't want to be one of those people that just mushes them together. So I feel like it's got to be sex party vibes. I don't know. For me. We've had our own individual threesome experiences, but together we have not had a threesome. And we've even discussed like, our own friends and stuff like hey would you consider doing it with this friend having him come over he's like no i don't think i could you know <laughs> manage thing thing is junk i'm like well what about you know this female friend of mine he's like well if you can get her into the picture then yeah so we talked about right. it we just not acted on it yet fun okay cool what about sex parties or clubs or things like that is that something you'd be into or like kinky places yeah more when i was single i used to be heavy in the bdsm community i live further south than i do now and I went to this very, they're pretty large. I'm not going to mention them just for the safety of their group. But it's a pretty large group. They're a big enough group in Florida to where they can host these events. I did get to go there um, one time with my ex and our partners. And that was the craziest 
experience ever. That was an amazing experience. I've never seen a woman consensually being beat on so hard in my life. And that was the biggest turn on. And we went back to our hotel room. This is basically an open, huge play party. They booked an entire floor of a hotel. The people that ran the group knew the owners of the hotel. Okay. So they got the cameras turned off. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, let me I'm back like, I'm trying to build some... that hotel. Oh, my God. That's so cool. Yeah, no. They got the cameras turned off for the night in the okay. hotel. So there was no monitoring. Nothing was recorded. Everyone was consensual. There was a lot of naked bodies, including mine, just running around the hall. Amazing. Room to room to room. You can go to five six different rooms there was a million different scenes going on there's someone doing a rope demonstration there was someone doing impact play in the hall there was a guy getting blow darts shot in his ass because that was just his kink he enjoyed that that was really cool blow darts yeah someone brought a blow dart gun oh my god for their partner oh that's hot it was cool and crazy there was a gentleman doing an impact play scene with his partner and he was i'm pretty sure as hard as he physically could was just whamming into her with every different toy and my ex and I, we went to our room and I asked him, I said, can we do a scene? Because I was not ready to publicly do a scene. Yeah. For multiple reasons. I just wasn't at the par for my own standards. I didn't want to. I wasn't comfortable. It was my first time doing a big play party like that. But we went back and that was the first scene that I did not read out on. And that's oh, the only wow. reason I've always read it out is because we were always pushing my limits. Yeah. So we we're always trying to see how much further can you go? How much further can you go? With consent, of course. Yeah. But that was yeah. the first time I did not read out during a scene. I think it helped that I was just that turned on watching someone else play that's kind of amazing yeah, it was awesome i wish i could go back now that i don't live so close to that area it's a lot harder for me to find a community oh i also totally random i got my first branding it was a liquid nitrogen brand <gasps> and that was really cool i would definitely get one of those more permanently i don't have it anymore so that one is semi-permanent oh wait you just opened up my world branding is something that's like super at my edge but like there's temporary ones with liquid nitrogen. I didn't know about this. There that is, makes sense. Yes. So this person was doing a demonstration and he is, I think you have to have a degree to be able to use the chemical. And he does. And he was able to get everything he would need. So he was teaching about it and how to do it and all that. And he offered, it was like, a, kind of like a ruler in thickness, like an inch long or wide. He offered these brandings, you know, if you want to get branded. You can come. This is what it feels like. If you want a permanent one, you would have to, you know, book with him privately and all of that. So with consent, I got my first one. It was just on my shoulder and it is way gone now. This is years ago. Cool. That was probably the coolest thing. And that was before I even had tattoos. I have two tattoos, but I enjoy pain, but I had very, very little pain tolerance. Okay. So getting the branding, it was really, really interesting. It It's like crazy, like almost like a mosquito bite with it. Whoa. Um, it's really cool. I wish it would have lasted a lot longer than it. Mine lasted five six months oh wow oh my gosh so it was a line you said it was like a little piece of ruler what, what yes just the line so cool oh my god <laughs> have you ever done any like electro play or other sensory stuff like that that was good for you yeah my ex had a wine i think it's like is it a tens unit i think you said there's different ones that is one of the electro play ones i believe that's what it was but he had like different attachments for it too. he had a little beaded flogger attachment which was really kind of cool and he had a whole bunch of different things that wasn't unenjoyable, but it didn't get me off. It was kind of cool to experience, yeah. but it didn't quite get me there. Nice. Oh, oh, okay. Totally random. But my first topless public scene was fire play for my 22nd birthday at this nightclub that was hosting a very specific BDSM night. So oh, I got my wow. first public flogging for my birthday, as well as my first public topless, completely topless fire play, which was really cool. They also did fire cupping. Oh, I've wow. I've kind of been everywhere at such a young age. I've done a little bit of it all. I was going to say, you've had so much experience. What was the fire play like? Is fire cupping kind of like the acupuncture thing where they like light it on yeah, fire? Yeah, that's and then exactly it... what it is. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Ah, oh, that's so cool. So did you have like all sorts of circles on you? I did. It was all on my back. But they started with, you know, this is what you can expect. And I watched a lot of other people do too. So this is only about a five, 10 minute little thing. It, it was a public state. So they were just allowing anyone to do it. And I was single at the time, so I was able to, hey, I want to try this, you know, get in line and they get you up. And they had a designated massage table. I'm pretty sure they're a therapist of some sort. They're like, I'm going to light your back on fire. Okay, cool. Just don't burn my hair off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do different patterns and sensations, which is really cool. And then they get to the fire cupping and they don't do it as intense to leave super deep marks. But you do get some little small circles, which is really warm feeling. Yeah. It's like an immediate warm sensation, but you don't feel 
like what movies and videos portray of burning people. Right, right. It's, wow. It's really cool, actually. It's, it's a different experience. Not necessarily a sexually, like, charged experience, but it's really cool to experience. That's amazing. How was it for you being topless publicly for the first time and single? I actually thought it was really cool. I lived in a state at the time that would have allowed it regardless of the event. Cool. So even if I were to have gone outside just because I wanted to topless, I wouldn't have necessarily gotten, quote unquote, in trouble. You know, no public indecency. So it was really nice. I don't have body issues necessarily, but I was never just, yeah, let me whip off my shirt. But I was yeah. really confident that night. And I really hadn't, there was alcohol. It was a party, essentially. I had maybe a couple sips previously. So it was very solid mind decision was made that night. Okay. I'm taking my top off to do this. Boobs are boobs. It is okay. You know? Amazing. And of course, no one touched or grabbed without consent. It was very, very nice. I enjoyed it. I met a lot of people, made a lot of connections. It was really cool. Okay. That was my next question. It sounds like you were doing these things bravely solo. Yes. Yes. That was my one and only time being as brave as I was solo. You meet a lot of people at these types of events. And because it is kink related, they're all very similarly openly minded. No one is going to judge you, especially in that environment, being naked or taking off your shirt or getting fire cuffed or getting publicly flogged. You know, it's all just, hey, this is your kink. You are consenting. Nothing bad is happening. We're good. It's really cool, actually. It's probably one of the best types of groups of people I've actually been around, more inviting than most just general public places. Yeah. I feel very involved and included, which is kind of crazy for it being a you know, just the kinky community as a whole, the vanilla world sees it and they're like, oh, that's so crazy. How could I? But you, you make family connections. Like these are people, they've got your back. Like no one's going to shame you for anything. I love that you found that so young. I really wonder, you know, it doesn't matter. I am where I am, but I'm like, what would my life have been like? I knew kinky stuff existed a decade earlier. Like it's so amazing. Are there any fantasies you haven't explored yet, but definitely want to, or just like go-to like fantasies you love that we haven't talked about yet very very few times i think three times total i have attempted not successfully but i have attempted to dom slash top my dom <laughs> <gasps> i've gotten him in cuffs okay. i've gotten him tied down and then i get to where he's quote unquote at my mercy and i freeze every okay. time so that is something i genuinely would love to explore more me too i'm such a submissive in the aspect of I get him there and I'm like I, I don't know what to do yeah. <laughs> so I have a plan but I can't go through with it, it I panic a little bit but it's, mm. it's all in fun you know he's never upset we usually just well, okay let me take control you know switch <sighs> dynamics or roles again but I'm just like I want to I really want to but it's like it's kind of like a little kid you get excited like oh I have this opportunity I'm a big kid now and then you're like wait I don't know what to do being a big kid I can't do this anymore <laughs> dude I get it I just get blank panic, even though I'm like, no, I know I could do something, but it's like the feeling, the feeling there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like, I, I don't know what to do. I have all the controls, but I don't know how to function. Do you have any noodles on how you might go forth with that? Because it sounds like it is something that you may try again. It's something I do want to try again. I've not figured out. Right okay. Now. And he's very open and very reciprocates well, but I just don't know what to do once I get there. And I've thought about it. I'm like, well, what if? And I'm like, no, wait, I don't know if I can. I need a little more courage and I need to be a little more outgoing, but it's definitely something we'll get to at some point in time. Do you feel like noodling on it? Because I could just tell you, I have one similar experience that kind of helped me a little bit when I was with my former master. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It was literally just, he would order me to worship him and he would be like, show me what you want to do now. And he would like force me to like pick something, which was hard for me. So then there were the times where like when things started to kind of slip (laughs) And there were like not so many orders and it was, you know, very, very kind of like cuddle fucky. Like it was, you know, yeah. vanilla-ish. I would often play in my head that he had given me an order. And that was like how I would like use my proactive self. Because I did have a whole oh, lot of I'll desire. Have to try that. I just had to point yeah, it. No, that's great. It wasn't as satisfying for me because it wasn't connection based. But like that was a way for me to like choose and like have agency and i have used that idea with vanilla lovers as i've like got like wobbly back into the dating world (laughs) well i've actually noticed just in my dating past and relationship past baby vanilla is a lot harder than being kinky i think so too like it got to where i had a vanilla relationship i think we just like hooked up a couple times 
but it was so weird for me to come without asking. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but those people, they just do it. And I'm like, they just do it. I can't ask. What is this? I it's like I mean, in my dynamic, I quote unquote need to. Same. Yeah. You know, or used to. Yeah. But it's, yeah. But it's just like I don't know how to if I don't ask, which vanilla people think is so odd. <laughs> And I'm just like, this is normal for me. What are you talking about? The first time I accidentally asked with a vanilla person, he was like, what? Yeah, whatever you want. And I was like, okay, well, uh." (laughs) but, you know, he didn't have the framework. And then what I what I tried the next time was just like telling them, telling them, telling them, telling them and then Mm -hmm. thanking them afterward. So I still got to feel like it was. Like for me, just yeah, a thank you yeah. still like keeps me in that nice spot. But yeah, vanilla sex is scary to me because I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. You're confusing. And then there's like, for me, it felt like disconnection too. Like that's oh, the part absolutely. That's I feel like having the team connection with someone is, for me anyway, it's, it's a lot easier to manage and work with. Having that definite line of this is who's running the show or in charge and this is who's, you know, they're taking it all in. It makes things a lot easier. Now, I'm only speaking for myself. Like, you know, maybe my partner doesn't want to be in charge or doesn't want to. I'm pretty sure he enjoys it. But, you know, just throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like having those definite roles. That's really nice. I do, too. It makes it a lot easier for me. I totally get it. And to clarify, I know and have many good vanilla friends who are super duper satisfied and super duper connected. I just have not had that experience myself especially in the casual sex that I've encountered. That may have to do with the way that my brain is wired and I'm not like getting the signals that some people get that like help them feel connection. What else have you not tried that you want to try? Anything else we haven't talked about? I think that's it. I, okay, no, I'll back up a little bit. This one's not as crazy, but I do want to try more sensation deprivation. Like we use a blindfold. I've mentioned to him before of also using like earplugs or earbuds or something taking away an additional sense because it heightens your other senses. And I think that's really cool. We haven't quite gotten there yet. We just haven't been able to, but that's something I would like to try. I mean, we're both pretty open to just about anything. We've done a lot. Like I can think like just little minute things, but as, as a whole, the big stuff, we've done pretty much a little bit of everything. Okay. Are there any other like disaster stories or triumph stories or like awkward things or unexpected things or things you just loved that we haven't heard yet? Yeah. So there was one story I wanted to bring up just backtracking to my height because I am a very, very tiny person and I am Asian person. And the only reason I mentioned that is because it's specific to this story. My ex, one of his biggest turn on towards me was because of my height and the fact that I was Asian. He told me explicitly that I was like his ideal woman and a quote-unquote prize to him. And I have never been more insulted in my life. I was like, really? Because I'm tiny and I'm Asian. Like, yeah, I love being short. I use that to my advantage all the time. When you're short, a lot of people, they'll pretty much do a lot of things for you because you're tiny. And it's kind of really nice. But I was just, just super upset by that comment. I yeah. feel like, you like me because I'm tiny and Asian, not because we're attracted to each other. Yeah. We have this going on. We have that going on. That yeah. was a huge disaster in our breakup. That was a big, big upsetting factor for me. That's one thing I tell is just, no, not because I'm tiny or not because I'm Asian. So that that was a big thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. I hear that. I also can't help but hear Princess Jasmine's voice in my head. I am not a prize to be won. Yes, yes, absolutely that line. (laughs) Wow, yeah. No, no, thank you. Please see me as a whole person. Please see me as a whole person. And then you can turn me into a tiny little prize. That you can objectify. That's yeah, the order see, of operations. If it's in the right setting, like had we done that, maybe like a degradation scene or something, yes. it may have been you know construed better. But it was just the fact that it was a blatant everyday statement in the conversation. That's what was really Oof. no, thank you. Because I've had some very consensual, horrible things said to me. Yeah, <laughs> it's it not a lot. The context is everything. <laughs> yes, yes. If you said this in a normal conversation, I would probably cry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then what are your overall hopes for your sex life going forward? You are 26 now. What do the next decades look like for you, you hope? That's a crazy question because I think about that all the time. I did say earlier that I hope that all of my hard limits and all of my no's go away. That is my biggest goal. And I don't really have any super big hard limits. I know one of them, which is we kind of joke about, but it's, it, it is serious, is ass to mouth. And it's just because I've eaten out my partner's ass and whatever so it's more of a 
concept I have to get past in my own head mm. to be able to do it. So I would like to do that and double penetration, of course. So I, I want to grow. I want to push past all of my own limits okay. to not have it, which sounds impossible. I'm sure it is possible. But that that's my end goal is to get there. Of the limits you have that you don't want. Well, because like, to be clear, like, I've been doing some research and forming my own bucket list. And the stuff that I put on my hard no list is like, I will not squish small animals. I will not get my blood let for vampires. I will not have poop in my mouth. I will not. There's some other ones that, I, that I'm putting on my list that we can put out. So like for me, I'm like, those ones need to stay. But all the stuff that I like currently have in place. What have I done? I've done ass to mouth stuff. I encourage you. Uh- <laughs> oh, my biggest one I joke about is no non-repeatable death scenes. <laughs> that's a good one yes yes no <laughs> snuff accident because i really like breath play as well and breath mm. play as an asthmatic person can be kind of dangerous absolutely so we had an incident where he was choking me consensually of course and i blacked out oh, and fuck. that kind of put breath play seriously on the back burner for both of us yes we very 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 carefully have gotten back into it but scared us both where we're like ooh, we gotta take a moment and backtrack that a lot yeah so yeah that was that's was kind of a scary moment but it was a learning moment so not your people death scenes is something that will probably never leave that limit list good that's that one limit that will never change i just always like to say that out loud because i am a person with an extremely literal brain unless i know that we're in a space where i can expect a metaphor and so like i do just in the name of accuracy so that i can make sure that i'm presenting your story accurately yeah no no absolutely oh that's so exciting okay so if you could go back in time and give younger you a piece of sex advice what age or ages would you pick and what would you say it would be eighth grade and i would tell myself to wait waiting is okay i think i pushed myself a little bit too much only because i wanted to but i think if i had the chance to go back i would have told myself to wait Mm. waiting is okay Beautiful. I am going to save that one for myself right now in my adult life. Waiting is okay. Yeah, and I've learned with like dry spells in between partners and different things. Waiting is not bad. Waiting encourages personal growth sexually and, and non-sexually. It is nice coming to terms with waiting is okay, especially in a very sexually fueled world that we are coming into. A lot of people have, no, you shouldn't wait. You should just do, you should just try to, you know, go, go, go. You don't always need to go, go, yeah. go. Sometimes it's okay to just sit down. I'm so glad that you said that. I really feel like I needed to hear that as well because I am turned on a lot and it doesn't mean I have to do anything with it a lot. And also it's okay. Like just before we started recording, I was telling you how how hard it is sometimes when I hear like great things from listeners and then I feel like a loser in my own sex life. And waiting is just the rest part until soon is now is what I keep telling myself. Oh yeah, so. well it's like I told you earlier, me coming out of postpartum, I'm having to rediscover myself and with me having felt sense of like getting myself off, I've had to step back and wait a little bit and refigure that out too. So I completely get it. Fuck yeah. Moonlight, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Do you have a sex question for me? What was your first ass to mouth experience and how would you, if you had to give advice like to someone like me going forward on being able to do it, what would be the best advice you could give to Lovers, that is our show this week. If you would like to hear my answers to the questions of the week, the details of my own sex stories, my sex-related thoughts of the moment, and creative updates, visit patreon.com slash wildly. If you don't care about extra content, but love sex stories and love supporting independent artists, the donation link in our show notes makes it super easy for you to support sex stories and mission creation's vision to help everyone get the support we all need to pursue our curiosities and lead lives full of love. And if you are feeling horny, that donation link or Venmo or the Cash App at Wildly are the only ways to let me know. Find me all over the internet at Wyoli. And if you want to get in touch with a thoughtful question, comment, or share, write me via email, Patreon, or OnlyFans. Apply to be a guest on Sex Stories at sexstoriespodcast.com and fill out a future guest application. And please, please, please take six to nine seconds to rate and review Sex Stories wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, especially if you have not yet done this. Super especially if listening to my sex stories has made you feel tingly in any way, shape, or form. And when you rate and review sex stories, remember that you are helping people find us. And that also helps balance out the shame-driven sex negative comments and ratings. So this is one easy, practical, tangible step you can take right now 
to make the world a sexier, more loving place. Sex Stories is edited by the all-will powerful Kimberly Loftus and was created by me, Wyo Lee, on behalf of Dante, my art mistress, captain of creation and star of origin, and it is part of Mission Creation, which you can learn more about at www.creation.place. Please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, enjoy whatever you enjoy so long as it's legal and consensual, and remember to share sex stories. (laughs) 